Okay, uh, good morning. So this is the second video uh, in our chemistry revision series. So this unit is going to be revising the main points of uh, C4, which is uh, OCL gateway C4, which is chemical patterns revision. So first of all, I want you to think about these three questions. What's the difference between an atom and an ion? Could you draw the electron arrangement of a sodium atom and a sodium ion? What's the difference? Uh, and then why does carbon uh, not form ions? Okay, just have a think about that before you move on. Well, the definitions here are atom uh, is when it's just one atom on its own. Uh, it has the same number of electrons and protons. Uh, and then a molecule is when we have multiple atoms joining together in a group uh, to form a compound, uh, and it's actually a covalently bonded compound, a molecule. Uh, and an ion is when an atom has either picked up an extra electron to get a full outer shell or has lost an electron. So if it picks up an electron, it's going to become negatively charged. And if it loses an electron, it's going to become positively charged. So here's a little task for you. Out of these molecules, sorry, out of these species down here, these chemical species, which one of them are atoms? Which one of them uh, are ones of them are ions and which are molecules? So have a think about that. See if you can identify which is which. Pause the video and come back in about two seconds. All right, okay, so the atoms are these ones. They're not charged. Uh, the molecules are these ones. So any one we have two atoms together or more. Uh, and then the ions are these ones, um, which are chemical species with a charge. And interestingly, you'll notice that this one down here, this is both an ion and a molecule. Uh, it's actually a compound ion. So that's the hydroxide ion present in alkalis. All right, now let's get onto our main sheet. Uh, so this sheet, if you have the, uh, have the ability, I recommend printing it out in A3 uh, and just following along uh, as we fill out all the main uh, parts of the sheet and we're going to revise, first of all, uh, atomic structure, then group one, the alkali metals and their reactions, um, then we'll look at group seven, the halogens and their reactions, how can we react to group one and seven together to form an, uh, an ionic salt, and then finally the noble gases just at the end there. Okay, so let's get going. First thing that I'd like you to do is to try and label this up here. What are the parts of the atom? Uh, could you state the charge and mass? Well, atoms, um, whenever we look at the periodic table, they have two numbers next to them. And these two numbers tell us a great deal. So the big number is the total mass of the nucleus. And the smaller number is the atomic number, or sometimes called the proton number. And that is the number of protons, but it's also the number of electrons in each atom. So here we have the protons and neutrons. Those together will equal, added up will equal the mass number. Um, the protons, um, let's say here, let's say the protons are the blue ones. So protons are positive. Um, this, uh, this atom here shown is actually not oxygen. This atom would be carbon because it has six protons and six neutrons. And you can look that up in the periodic table down here. Look, it's got 12. Uh, six protons plus six neutrons equals 12. And then there's six electrons going around the outside. So that's the structure of an atom. <clears throat> but what about the alkali metals, the group one? Now, these are these elements down here. So here I've got a space where you could try, if you want to, to put in the electron arrangements of lithium, sodium, and potassium using the periodic table. Have a go at that if you'd like to. Pause the video and come back in a couple seconds. OK, did you get it right? Here is what you should have drawn. So lithium has an electron arrangement of 2, 1. Sodium, 281, and potassium is 2881. Now, the thing that you'll notice there, hopefully, is that each of these has one electron in its outer shell. So that is um, the feature, the main feature of group one. Group one has one electron in its outer shell. So this arrangement with one electron in the outer shell um, means that these metals are very reactive because they'd like to have a full outer shell. And the best way of them doing that, the easiest way for them to do that, is to lose that outer shell electron in a chemical reaction. So um, let's have a look at some of their chemical reactions. So the main reaction that you probably will remember from classroom demonstrations is if you put these alkali metals in water, they react vigorously. Um, some of them catch fire. Hydrogen gas is produced rapidly. Uh, and the potassium reaction looks like this. Um, if we go down the group, so that's potassium there. If we go down the group to the next one, rubidium, or sorry, actually to cesium down here even, cesium is more reactive. So actually, 
the, the most reactive one that you've seen in class probably is potassium because rubidium and cesium are too reactive to do in schools. So reactivity increases as we go down the group. So um, they form plus one ions. As you go down the group, lithium to potassium and on to cesium, the reactivity increases. Also, the melting point decreases and the metals get softer. Now, the chemical reaction with water can be described like this. So a metal plus water goes to metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Now, here is a balanced symbol equation there. Two uh, potassium solid plus two H2O liquid reacts to become two lots of potassium hydroxide. That's aqueous and plus hydrogen, and that should be a gas there. Actually, I missed that out. So why are, does this reactivity increase as you go down the group? Well, we have to look back over here um, and we look at the electrons. So this electron here with lithium, its outer shell electron is quite close to the nucleus. Whereas if we go to potassium, the outer shell electron is quite far from the nucleus, which means it can be lost more easily. It doesn't feel that uh, attraction from the positive nucleus as much. So it can be lost more easily when it forms an ion. And that basically means um, that it's more reactive. Okay, what about um, reactions with chlorine? So you can take, let's say, sodium uh, metal and react it with chlorine gas. And the reaction is going to look a little bit like this. What's going on in that reaction? Uh, so we're going to be looking at this box here. And actually, I've zoomed in on this on the next slide, so I'm just going to zoom ahead slightly. So here is the reaction between sodium and chlorine. So basically, they react vigorously. Uh, so sodium reacts vigorously with chlorine gas to produce an ionic salt. And this would be the same for potassium or lithium. Um, so sodium plus chlorine goes to sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is just table salt. So 2Na, you probably have it solid, plus chlorine gas goes to two lots of sodium chloride. That's a balanced chemical equation. So that reaction would look a bit like this. So at the beginning here, we can see that the chlorine gas is kind of a pale greenish gas in this kind of gas jar. Uh, and the sodium metal is just this little blob down there in the middle. Now, to start this chemical reaction, you actually need a tiny little drop of water, um, which just gives it enough, basically, activation energy to get going. And what's actually happening in that reaction? Well, what's happening is we're forming an ionic compound. So down here, we can see sodium, sodium, uh, an atom of sodium. It has an electron arrangement of 2, 8, 1. And over here, we have chlorine, an atom of chlorine. It has an electron arrangement of 2, um, 8, 7. So what happens when they react? Hopefully you know already, perhaps you can sort of see a little clue here, over here, but this is what's gonna happen. Sodium will lose an electron and give it to chlorine, and that's really what releases the energy that we can see in the video, um, that glowing light. So when it does lose that electron, each atom now becomes an ion, it becomes charged. So sodium has lost an electron, it becomes positively charged, and chlorine has gained an electron and it becomes negatively charged. So that means uh, that we now have an ionic bond, positive and negative attracted together quite strongly, uh, and that's an ionic bond. Okay, so did you get all of that? At the bottom of that A3 sheet, there's a little space below this picture. See if you can, pause the video, and copy and complete this text using the keywords written right here, okay? Give that a go, take a couple minutes, pause the video, and then come back and we'll talk more about ionic compounds. Okay, so let's see if you got it right. Just quickly click through. So it's an ionic compound, and when it forms, sodium loses an electron from its outer shell. So it gives, its full outer sh uh, gives it a full outer shell, and now it becomes an ion with a charge of plus one. The chlorine atom, on the other hand, starts with seven electrons in its outer shell, and it sort of takes in or accepts the electron coming from sodium, so that it now has eight electrons, which is, again, a full outer shell. Um, it's now a char uh, an ion with a charge of minus one, and then we have the attraction together uh, by strong forces in a lattice. So that last word, lattice, maybe that is causing some confusion. So here is a lattice. An ionic lattice is a regular pattern of... Um, of ions, kind of like a grid, but three-dimensional grid. And when the ions are held in this lattice, they're really, really strong forces of attraction between all of them. And that means that uh, they have high melting points. It also means that they can't conduct electricity if it's a solid ionic compound. 
But if you melt the ionic compound, you make it molten, or if you dissolve it in solution, then the ions can start to move. That's important for electrolysis, um, both in unit C6 when we're looking at aluminium oxide uh, and electrolysis in unit C3. So, skip through this bit. So, what can we say are the key points looking down here about this uh, properties of ionic compounds because of this lattice? Well, first of all, ions are arranged in the lattice. Write this down. There's very strong forces of attraction between all the ions. They have high melting and boiling points. Um, and they don't conduct electricity as a solid, but they do if, if they're molten or if they're in solution. Okay? So, so far we've covered group one and their reactions with uh, chlorine gas. Now chlorine gas is an example of one of these, a halogen. Here it is on the periodic table right there. So chlorine gas is a halogen. So what should we, what do we need to know about the halogens? Okay, well, here they are. First of all, they are reactive gases. Now they're diatomic. So that means because they've got seven electrons in their outer shell, they normally pair up sharing um, one pair of electrons between them, forming a covalent bond and between the two atoms. So they exist as molecules, diatomic molecules. So here would, here's a kind of a space fill model of fluorine gas, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So they have seven electrons in their outer shell. They form minus one ions. And, and in this case, as you go down the group, the reactivity actually decreases. Um, and the reason for that is very similar to uh, the group one. It's that when they take in an extra electron, because remember that's what they do, they take in an extra electron, the electron feels a stronger attraction towards fluorine because the electron would only be in this second shell here, quite close to the nucleus. With chlorine, the electron would be coming in at the third shell, not quite as close to the nucleus, and for bromine, it would be coming in at the fourth shell, which is reasonably far away from the nucleus, so it feels less of a pull. So this fluorine basically really wants to react. It really wants electrons. Also, trends are the boiling points of these increase and the color gets darker. So in terms of um, what they're like, this up here, fluorine is a pale yellow gas. Chlorine is a pale greenish gas. Bromine can be a liquid or a gas, depending on the temperature. So it's like a reddish brownish liquid or a reddish brownish gas. Now iodine, this purple one here, it's purple as a gas, but also it, it can be a solid at um, room temperature. So it's a sort of gray solid, but if you warm it gently, it produces a purple vapor. You may have seen that in class. So the key points there about the halogens uh, are written here, and I've sort of tried to show that color change uh, with this kind of gradation as we go down from yellow fluorine through chlorine, bromine, iodine, sort of purple, and then below would be a gray solid astatine. Okay, so reactivity of halogens um, is quite important because we've got this thing called a halogen displacement reaction, okay, which is quite, um, quite tricky. So let's look at that. Let's go through it here. What is a halogen displacement reaction? So a halogen displacement reaction is when a more reactive halogen would displace a less reactive halogen from its compound. So I'm going to take you to a little animation of this. We'll just jump on to here. And now we shall look at this. Let's just make this full screen. Here we go. So first of all, here is a compound of bromine, okay, potassium bromide. I'm putting it in these tubes. It's clear, okay? Right, what's next? Now I've got chlorine. Now this is chlorine gas, but it's dissolved in water, so we call it chlorine water. But this is a, uh, a, a molecule, but it's an element, chlorine as an element. Now, the displacement reaction will happen because chlorine is more reactive than bromine. So what happens when you add the chlorine to the bromine, you get color change. That's because chlorine basically um, changes place with the bromine, uh, and so it becomes potassium chloride, and bromine gets released, which is brown. Okay, let's see what happens. Um, what does this tell us about the reactivity? Well, it tells us that chlorine is more reactive than bromine. So this is the, these are the products that are formed here. Okay, well, we've still got some potassium bromide here. Let's try another displacement reaction. Now let's try iodine. So iodine is less reactive than bromine. So see if you think there'll be a change. 
Now there's no color change there. We just had purple going into purple. So there's no color change there, which means that we still have the same things that we started with, potassium bromide and iodine. So uh, this one, we did have a displacement reaction and this one we didn't. Right, let's go back to our sheet. Just quickly go here. So what we see is that chlorine, the uh, atom, sorry, the element, has the ability to, to displace bromine from a compound and also can it also displace iodine from a compound. Bromine is less reactive, so bromine can't displace chlorine from a compound, but it can displace iodine from a compound. And iodine is less reactive than either chlorine or bromine, so it cannot displace either one. It's worth also saying that fluorine, the most reactive halogen, will be able to displace all of these. It will be able to displace chlorine as well. So um, here you go. Here's the key information. The more reactive halogen will displace a less reactive halogen from its compound, and there's one example of that with a little picture here. Oh, I do remember now that I did actually find a video of this reaction with iron wool, so let's quickly look at this. Does this work? Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, never mind about that. See if you can find it. Uh, I'll just go back so it reloads so you can see which one that you should click on. So just look, this, this is a YouTube reaction of chlorine and iron. I'll try and put a link in the video. So going back to that final issue of displacement reactions, try and think for yourself, which of these would produce a reaction? In which of these pairings is the halogen water more reactive than the halide solution? Okay, pause the video, see if you can have a think about that. Okay, so it's going to look like this. This one, we will have a reaction because bromine is more reactive than iodine. And this one, sorry, we won't have a reaction here, sorry, because bromine is more reactive than iodine. In this one, we also will not have a reaction because bromine is uh, less reactive than the chlorine. And then this one, we will have a reaction because bromine is more reactive than the iodine, okay? So that's everything. Uh, that's C4 basically in a nutshell. Oh, apart from the last thing, noble gases. Now they're pretty boring actually, so it won't take long at all. They have full outer shells already, so they don't react. Uh, they're colorless, uh, they're odorless, and the only thing you need to know is because these atoms are getting bigger as we go down the group, um, the boiling points get higher, and so does the density of the gas. So helium is, is a very light gas, it will float, whereas xenon is a heavy gas that sinks. Uh, and if you want to check it out, you can find a video uh, and see what happens to um, people's voices when they breathe in helium gas or xenon gas of different densities. I should say that don't try that at home because breathing in xenon gas is quite dangerous. Okay, so that's C4. Uh, hope that's been helpful. Uh, we've covered the whole unit, hopefully in under 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, please let me know if you'd like me to do any other videos. You can get this sheet from me as well uh, in school. Thanks.